I did not expect to make this video. In fact, I wasn't even sure I was going to buy this game a few weeks ago. But as you can see, I did end up making this video, which can only mean one thing. For the unaware, I am a huge fan of the original Paper Mario and have covered this series at length to discuss my distaste for the way things have changed in the last few entries. So hopefully you understand how much the Origami King has to have blown me away to feature it here on Good Game Design. At first glance, it may appear to have very little in common with the first two games that many hold so dear, but that's exactly what made it all the more impressive. Despite its faults and switching up a beloved core mechanic, it somehow still had the same charm and spirit of the original classics. Let's talk about it. I'll be the first to admit that Origami King has an exceptionally slow start. It took several hours for things to take off. And believe me, I was grumbling for most of the intro. I hadn't been hit even once in combat and had over 10,000 coins, what is this? But eventually, when the overbearing tutorial subsided and I came to terms with the fact that this was going to be something different, it started to win me over. It reminded me of the other things I loved so much about Paper Mario. Incredible set pieces, memorable characters, and top-notch hilarious writing. In fact, this is probably the best the series has seen in that regard. I love that all the regular enemies in the Mushroom Kingdom are good guys now. Origami has taken over and they're the real threat. This led to some hilarious dialogue and story beats along the journey. I don't know how they made me care about a simple bob -omb, but by Bobby the Mad Lads did it! After around the first boss, things just continued to get better and better until the end. A particular highlight for me was the fourth chapter where you're set free to roam the open sea and explore. You're not given any direction other than trying to locate the source of the purple streamer, and had to discover hidden islands and add them to your map to reveal your true destination. But really, each chapter was beautifully unique and full of wacky scenarios that I've come to expect from a Paper Mario adventure, and the music only accentuated those fantastical moments. This has an unbelievably bumpin' soundtrack. At first I was worried that it'd be shorter than past entries since there's only 5 streamers to find, but it's actually longer than 64 or 1000 Year Door because each section has lots of diversions and other objectives along the way, as well as multiple boss fights and upgrades in the form of Velemental Powers. Some of these can feel like oh no, whoopsie padding at first, but honestly every new wrench thrown in ended up being a delight to experience. I wanted to focus on the combat though, because this was easily the most divisive change the developers implemented. The ring system seemed intriguing from the trailers, but not having any control over your partners, the lack of meaningful badges, and <gasps> no XP were a big turnoff for some. And obviously, you should not go in expecting the same system on a mechanical level, but I will say over the course of the game, it did start to feel like the good old days, in terms of strategy and plans of attack changing over time. Let me explain. You start the game being able to turn rings left and right or shift them up and down, and the goal is to either line up enemies to stomp four in a row, or lump them in a square closest to you for a pulverizing hammer attack. As I said, this starts out way too simple for my liking, but it quickly picks up steam until you're thinking multiple moves ahead and sitting there just trying to picture the solution. And the very first time you make a mistake or don't solve the riddle in time, you realize just how bad a wrong move can be. These guys pack a massive punch when they gang up on you. It's less about the brute force required to succeed, and more about cracking the code of the puzzle in order to stay alive. And as the game progresses, you'll encounter lots of clever switch-ups to keep you on your toes. Like the originals, there will be spiky enemies lined up for a jump, or flying Koopas out of reach of your hammer. Which means either having to use specific weapons that will protect you, or rearranging the arena to make sure you can damage your foes. Eventually, you'll see snowballs used as shields, piranha plants hiding underground when you move, or my personal favorite, boos that disappear after a few seconds, meaning you have to memorize the correct solution and pull it off blindly. I felt like a boss the first time this happened, and I was able to remember the layout without knowing what to expect. Spatial awareness skills on luck. Even cooler, the game will introduce baddies that adapt as you move around, like these paper families that fold in on themselves with every turn of the ring. I wish guys like this were utilized more often. They really kept the battle system interesting. 
so the puzzles get a lot more difficult as you go, but luckily there's also tons of options at your disposal to ease up on the challenge. The one I ended up using the most was enlisting cheers from the various toads I've rescued. As long as you give them at least 100 coins, they'll complete the first move for you, which was normally enough to nudge me toward the final solution. And since you typically get over 100 coins per battle anyway, it doesn't really feel like a punishment, but rather an additional option if you're stuck. You also gain little bonus rewards the more toads you collect, like health or damage to enemies, so this encourages exploration in the world as well, I love it. But in case you don't want an exact answer just given to you, you can also buy more time to think longer, or also ask Olivia for a hint. You can buy a 1-up mushroom to gain a second chance if you reach zero hit points, or if you mess up and happen to find yourself in a pinch, special items like the POW block can easily save you from a nasty death. Lastly, if puzzles aren't really your thing and you find yourself struggling, you can go to the battle lab to practice various setups and hone your skill. All of these fail safes really came in handy because the boss fights, while some of my favorite parts of the game, are also the most demanding. Instead of turning the stage around yourself, now the goal is to reach the boss at the center and figure out the most effective way to take it down. Sometimes that means opening chests to unlock the on switch so you can use magic circles and toss them into the air, while other times you need to attack them at specific sections to lower their defenses or protect yourself from a devastating blow. Each one had unique strategies and clever mechanics to try and work around, like tape forcing two rows to move together, or objects covered in ice breaking if you shifted them off screen. You have to prioritize your options since you only have a few moves, so while it might be nice to add an extra attack to your route, maybe it's better to play it safe and transfer a heart along the way instead. On some occasions, it felt a little like trial and error to figure out the right way to proceed, but again, there are methods to help you out in the form of hints or notes scattered on the battlefield. I will say the real-life objects of colored pencils and staplers being bosses felt uh, out of place in a cartoony Mario universe, but I was happy to find that there is an actual story explanation for this being possible, so at least that made them semi-believable as villains. Regardless, the mechanics more than made up for it, and I found this spin on the ring system a great way to round out the combat. But then, they didn't stop there! In a way to appease those that don't like the turn-based aspects, they incorporated paper macho battles where you don't enter a special screen at all, but instead have to skirmish in real time against these giant cobbled abominations. While they're not quite as intensive in terms of strategy, I think they're a perfect addition to break up the monotony of traditional encounters. They're equally unique in presentation and kept the whole adventure running smoothly. Variety is the spice of life after all. This results in a system that feels very accessible and able to be tailored however you'd like. Say you want to avoid battles altogether. For the most part, they're pretty easy to skirt past, and they even give you a special item midway through to turn yourself invisible and avoid suspicions. If you only engage when you really want to, it makes the occasional required battle feel less tedious. Obviously, it has some downsides. I never really got the hang of fleeing, I guess it's just really tight timing, but I almost always failed and then you just get destroyed and have to try again anyway. And once you're powered up enough, you can beat weaker enemies with your hammer and not have to fight them at all. But if they hit you first, you still have to go through the confrontation, that was annoying. But it does feel like the whole package is pretty balanced and made with its strengths in mind. You do level up over time, it's just by collecting heart pieces throughout the world. And there is reason for battling because sometimes you need confetti to progress in the game as well as fat stacks of coins. So I wouldn't say it's bad, just different, and more focused on exploring every inch of the colorful landscapes. All of this combined to create a memorable adventure that once I'd finished, I simply wish there was more of. I had a blast from start to finish, and something Origami King does have that the older games lacked is a plethora of various collectibles to gather that'll keep me busy in the endgame for quite some time. There's a museum chocked full of rewards for all the toads you've saved, holes you've filled, and treasures you've discovered. From a music jukebox, to a 3D gallery, to behind the scenes developer sketches and cut content. There's even a a wall of trophies for special achievements that I hadn't received a single one for even after beating the game. Somehow it still had that Paper Mario flavor I've loved for decades while using drastically different building blocks to get there, and that is truly an accomplishment worth celebrating. At the end of the day, I had to remind myself that the original games aren't going anywhere. I can always go back and play them if I want to feel nostalgic. 
But if you are really yearning for something new that is in the same vein as 64 and Thousand Year Door, I would be completely remiss if I didn't mention Bug Fables. You have to check this game out. Battles have all that old school goodness, experience, badges, flower points, but it has some cool new additions too, like the order of your characters affecting their attack power and their vulnerability on the battlefield, but you can switch them up mid-battle in order to gain an advantage. While you don't grow a whole team of partners, there are three with varying abilities that you synergize together to solve puzzles and take down challenging bosses. I can't say it's quite as funny or charming as the Paper Mario we know and love, but it's by far the closest thing I've seen since the GameCube era. So if Origami King doesn't quite wet your whistle, please give this one a go. It's on Switch now, so you have no excuse. That being said, I really hope people don't write off Mario's latest folded outing just because it's not more of the same. It truly is that enjoyable, and had just as many wondrous settings and situations as the best indie games that I've praised to high heavens all over this channel. From Luigi inadvertently saving the day, to Shy Guy game shows, and disco dance parties, there's something here for everyone. If for nothing else, do it for Bobby, man. Please, you gotta do it for Bobby.